Um, welcome. It's, it's so great to be here with you all. Um, we're going to take about five minutes to let folks trickle in. Um, but if you are arriving, we'd love for you to introduce yourself. You can drop your name in the chat. You can tell us why you're here or something you're looking forward to about this event. If you've read the book, you can share some thoughts about what you've read. Um, and you also can feel free to invite friends into this Zoom if you want. You can share the link privately. We're not posting it publicly online right now, uh, just to basically, you know, preserve some level of uh, privacy and safety um, and, and mitigate, you know, the chance of Zoom trolling and that sort of thing. Um, but do feel free to send the link to friends um, if you have friends who want to join. Um, that being said, this event is going to be capped at 100 people. So uh, I think we're at around 40 or so right now. Um, obviously, if we fit, we're at 60. If we if we reach 100, we will have to close the doors to new attendees, but we will record the event um, and aim to share it later this month. So if you have friends who, who end up not being able to come for any reason, um, you can let them know that. Um, so yeah, please feel free to uh, just get settled in. Um, if there are people you know here, you can say a little hello to them in the chat. Um, I am going to just take a second to get my own chat set up. Um, and then we will kind of jump into things. So the way that this event is going to work is we're going to do an hour of readings from contributors to the Long COVID Survival Guide. And after that, we will jump into uh, maybe a, a little question and answer optional conversation uh, for the second hour, second half hour. So that's optional in the sense that some of our contributors may stay after the first hour to engage, but it's it's not required. Um, we're just going to kind of feel it out and see see how folks are feeling. I see some people in the chat. It's so great to see you all. Hi, Kristen. Hi, Rowan. Uh, hi, Cheryl. Um, Ah, I love it. People ordering the book. <laughs> I hope they come soon. We are very much still in uh, the pandemic supply chain issues world. So uh, some people have gotten books early. Some people are telling me they're still waiting for their books, but um, we promise they will come eventually. Um, so to kick this off, um, I, I want to start by just thanking our co-sponsors for this event, um, uh, Long COVID Justice, Body Politic, Patient-Led Research Collaborative, and Auto Straddle. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming. I am really grateful to be here. And um, I know we have you know, a few more folks who will be trickling in over the course of the hour. So I, I figure that most people here are relatively familiar with the book or have received copies, um, but I, I think it might still be helpful to sort of give a little roadmap to understanding uh, the project that we've created here. So the Long COVID Survival Guide is a peer-to-peer -peer guidebook on surviving long COVID, and the book really seeks to do a few distinct things. So I would say First off, we, we want to provide emotional support. A lot of us found a lifeline in support groups when we first got sick. And this book is in many ways our attempt to provide that lifeline in book form for others who may need it. I think um, my hope here is that every reader will be able to find something in these stories uh, that they relate to. Um, our second big goal here is just to provide tangible logistical advice. I think that things are quite different than when I first got sick. Um, there is actually a lot of information on long COVID online, but it can be very difficult to parse through it. It can be very difficult to kind of figure out what's trustworthy, what's not, um, just even understanding where to start. So um, this book seeks to provide tips on navigating research managing symptoms, uh, you know, tests that you can ask your health providers to run, crucial information about disability benefits, financial support, workplace accommodations, et cetera. Um, and then I think we also, with this book, are really trying to just bear witness to what we experienced. Many of us got sick in, uh, you know, what was called the first wave in the United States. And um, I, I think many of us have also been inspired in our work on this project by previous um, disability justice and health justice uh, movements that really modeled the importance of peer-to-peer -peer support. So I hope that by documenting our own stories and advice, we can provide a bit of a roadmap to the next generation of health justice advocates or 
folks that are, you know, dealing with, with similar issues to the ones that we came up against. And then finally, um, I think, you know, a lot of long COVID advocates are working really hard um, with researchers to move forward research and bring us closer to having, you know, tried and true and FDA approved treatments and eventually someday a cure. Um, but in the meantime, patients still need help. And I think that we have gathered a lot of information, um, we as patients and, and, you know, the allies that we work with, um, that can help people with long COVID find a better quality of life and, and care. And so um, eventually, I hope that a book like this can be updated with, with far more scientific breakthroughs from researchers like Akiko Iwasaki, who wrote our afterword. But I also know that this book will remain important um, because long haulers aren't the only people who have to navigate biased healthcare systems or face financial stress as a result of an illness or have to deal with, you know, ableism or ignorance from, from friends and family and peers. So I think this book is relevant for many different communities. And my hope is that it will be read by folks without long COVID as well, who are seeking to better understand our experience. So as I mentioned earlier, the way that this event is going to work is that we're going to have 10 different contributors read very short excerpts from their chapters. Um, these excerpts are short. I want you to think of them almost as scenes from the Long COVID Survival Guide. This is a book that, you know, brings you to Baltimore and India and Canada and London and a lot of different places. And, and we're trying to kind of give you a taste of all those things uh, in, in this reading. These, these excerpts will only scratch the surface of the, the wide array of advice provided in this book. But after our first hour of readings, you'll have the option to stay and, and chat a bit more with any contributors who, who are still here. Um, and we can potentially dig a little bit deeper into uh, that advice. So I, I wanna kind of close this, this little introduction by just taking a moment to recognize uh, that this event in many ways feels familiar to me. Um, before the pandemic, I led events very similar to this one. I would bring in 10 or so speakers to share short stories on a specific topic related to the intersection of wellness and social justice, um, usually in New York City, through a group I ran called Body Politic. Um, when the pandemic got sick, when the pandemic hit and I got sick, um, a lot of things changed and all of this stopped. And obviously body politic went on to become something very important, but also slightly different. And I had to grieve the loss of that part of my life and myself. Um, so it feels really meaningful to be back here. And I don't even want to say back here because we're doing this better now. We're doing this more accessibly. Um, and I feel like I'm doing this with a whole new lens on, on what it means to, to think about the intersection of health and social justice. Um, and I think this experience of finding your way back to something after that you loved after dealing with illness, you know, with new knowledge about yourself and the world and maybe even a better way of approaching it is really what I hope for all long haulers who read this book, whether it's something really small or something really big to be able to kind of find that hobby or find that passion or find that self sense of self again, but through, you know, a new lens. So uh, with that, I'm going to read a short excerpt from my introduction to the book um, before introducing nine other amazing contributors who I am so excited to share with you. <clears throat> if you've ever had a serious illness or have cared for someone with a serious illness, you may be aware that there's a range of people who see pain, fear, and sickness and attempt to provide answers. Some of these people are medical professionals trying to do their job. Others are well-meaning health or wellness enthusiasts. Some are just out to capitalize on your experience or scam you. Not all advice is created equal. When we got sick, there were no COVID experts. I now know that there were people with post-viral and infection-initiated chronic illnesses like ME-CFS who knew that the pandemic would likely result in a mass disabling event and who could speak to the experience of living with a complex multi-systemic chronic illness. These people and the providers and researchers who have worked with them would eventually become a source of vital information. You'll read more about them in this book. But back in March of 2020, all I knew was that no one, not the doctors treating me, not the international or federal health agencies, not even the infectious disease experts speaking on CNN could explain what was happening to my body. I could keep waiting around for them to find answers or at the very least acknowledge my pain, or I could learn from others who have been neglected or ignored by medicine and science and crowdsource the information myself. 
I wasn't a scientist. Hell, I'd been a history major, (laughs) but it turned out that history degree would come in handy. As soon as I had enough energy to open my laptop, I started digging around for old college syllabi, rereading first-person accounts of the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, ACT UP, and other activist groups that provided peer-to-peer support, care, and knowledge gathering for people living with HIV. I reread a book about people who taught themselves how to perform abortions before they were legal, and I paged through old photos of medical clinics run by the Black Panthers. I'd analyzed all these texts in school, but reading them felt different this time. A common theme was emerging. If you think no one cares about you, you might be right, and you might need to do it yourself. This book is authored primarily by people who have experienced long COVID. Most are still living with the illness. Their professional and personal backgrounds are diverse. Some have degrees in science or medicine, others are professional writers, educators, or activists, but their most important qualification is their lived experience. Having reported closely on long COVID since it first emerged, I can tell you that it was the actions of long haulers themselves that triggered a global response to this illness. Nearly every piece of knowledge we have gained about this disease, as well as every attempt to provide systemic support, would not exist without the leadership and input of long COVID patients. We are the reason it has a name, a disease classification code, interim guidance, dedicated clinics, a page on the CDC website, and funded research. Obviously, there are also a lot of allies outside of our lived experience, journalists, scientists, and medical professionals, to name a few, who have raised awareness and carefully listened to our stories, using them to inform scientific research and sometimes making major breakthroughs. You'll hear from a couple of them in this book. We wouldn't be where we are today without them. But a guidebook on long COVID must be authored by those who've experienced it firsthand, and ideally a diverse group given the varying disease presentations and experiences that can characterize this illness. Otherwise, we are rewriting history, plagiarizing ideas, and honestly likely to get a lot wrong. That's because patients have been able to learn about long COVID for longer and from a much more intimate vantage point than anyone else. From day one in the support group, I was learning. I learned that the painful headaches that made my eyes burn and forced me to turn off all lighter stimuli were likely migraines. I learned from people experiencing symptoms for the first time and from people with years of experiencing managing chronic illnesses. We learned together. I think that all you need is one person who truly understands and believes what you're going through. For me, that person was my friend, Sabrina. Then it was 10,000 strangers on the internet. Today, it is a wide network that includes providers, health experts, disability justice advocates, and friends and family. You may not be fortunate to have such a network yet, and that's common. Long COVID is still widely misunderstood. I hope this book can be the start of such a network for you. I hope it envelops you in a warm hug of words that resonate with your experience and promises you that, at bare minimum, you are believed, your life matters, and you certainly are not alone. That's just a little excerpt uh, from my chapter of the book, um, which introduces kind of what to think about when going through this book. Um, I am very excited now to introduce our next speaker, who is a dear friend and colleague, Shamir L. Smith. She is an award-winning middle school teacher in Baltimore who, since June 2020, has acted as a writer, thought leader, and media and guest panelist on international and national platforms, using her voice and personal experiences to bring awareness to the economic, psychological, and physical devastation of long COVID on urban communities, She was personally chosen to testify before Congress, offering greater awareness of the often overlooked plight of Black, disabled, and low-income women in America. Now it is time for me to find Shamir in this chat and (laughs) give me one second, (laughs) add you here. Shamir, take it away. (laughs) Thank you so much. Um, What a beautiful reading um, and beautiful um, uh, part of your chapter. I don't believe I feared being sick or even dying as much as I feared having to ask others for support. I've never had to explain to another Black woman why needing anyone is the devil's work. We stir the knowledge of this mantra in our coffee and season it on our plates. When I got COVID, I asked for nothing and I told no one of what coursed through my body. No one except mom. I'd heard of her months before I saw her. It was 2004 and Eric, my then boyfriend, brought brought me to church. The service closed with remarks from a woman who barely reached the microphone. 
She wore a bus operating uniform and white footy socks with no shoes. This was Pastor Paula Murray. She moved and swayed like a Southern Baptist preacher woman with a city flair. There weren't many women pastors who led black churches, so I knew she was something special. Any woman with that much chutzpah, I wanted to meet. Two years later, Eric and I suffered a nasty breakup, and I wanted to quit the church. When I presented my decision to Pastor Mary, she refused to accept it. She showered, she showered me with love, telling me to brush off my shoulders and pick myself up. From that moment on, I stopped calling her Pastor Mary. Her advice and support was like that of a caring mother. And so without any fanfare, she became my mom and godmother. Mom was no longer just my spiritual leader. She would pray for me when I experienced any hardship or setback and coddle me when I was being spoiled and selfish. No one was prouder of my graduating from college and becoming a teacher. And if, if she even thought for a second that I was being mistreated, she would give anyone a talking to so severe they would question her allegiance to the, allegiance to the Lord. She even built me a room in her home when I faced eviction from a slumlord. To mom, when I got sick, I wasn't a patient, record, number, or statistic. I wasn't even Shamir. Shug was the name she had given me. After the controversial antagonist turned beloved family friend in the color purple, we couldn't be less alike except like Seely, Shug's friend and eventual caretaker, mom had welcomed me into her life among her family, daring anyone to dispute it. For about nine months, Mom and I primarily communicated via text. She would send me scriptures and encouragement in short sentences. Mom's patience, care, will, and belief in God's ability to heal me was what I held on to for nearly two years battling long COVID. During the moments when my eyes were heaviest and my ears struggled to hear through pain and inflammation, it was her unwavering determination to keep me alive that broke through the cracks that death wanted me to fall through. A cracking did occur. It happened inside of me. I cracked with need. I became greedy for it. I drank from its cup, feasted on its nourishment bathe in the luxury of the magic of expressing a need and it being answered. I needed every morsel of food she prepared, whether I actually ate it or not. The smell alone awakened my dead taste buds, causing me to consider what tiny pleasures might emerge from living for another day. I needed those cries from God's, I'm sorry, I needed those cries for God's help that she woefully extended to heaven when she thought I was asleep. When I heard her saying my name, I knew it meant I was still alive. If anything, needing someone against my will provoked my spirit to live. It broke my pride in pieces, making it acceptable to boldly ask for what I wanted and needed, leaving shame behind closed doors I would never open again. Thank you. That was so beautiful, Shamir. Thank you so much. Um, and that was from Shamir's chapter on finding a caregiver called Closer Than They Seem. Um, I am going to uh, now add uh, the lovely Heather Hogan, um, if I can find you in here, um, to uh, read an excerpt of her chapter. Um, and Heather, just going to read a quick bio. Four. Um, Heather is the senior editor and social media director of Autostraddle, the largest website for LGBTQ women and non-binary people on the internet. She lives in New York City with her wife and their cackle of rescued pets, who you can see some of if you follow her work on Twitter, <laughs> at the Heather Hogan. Um, Heather is reading from uh, a chapter with one of my favorite headlines, standing tall and sitting right back down, living with dysautonomia. Heather, I will hand the mic off to you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> if you'd asked me what was wrong with me two months after my initial COVID infection in March 2020, I would have sincerely told you everything, and it wouldn't have been much of an exaggeration. I got COVID during New York City's first wave when tests, treatments, and even hospital space were nearly impossible to access. I had what was referred to as a mild case, which meant I never needed to be put on a ventilator, and that I'd survived. At the time, the guidelines for going to the hospital were, don't do it unless you can't finish speaking a sentence out loud or your lips are turning blue. 
After about two weeks of a slight fever, shortness of breath, chest congestion, and moderate fatigue, I seemed to turn a corner and was well on my way back to my pre-COVID life, which included working 60 hours a week, volunteering, managing a full social calendar, riding my bike multiple times a week, and walking 10,000 steps every day. Despite the prevalence of post-viral illnesses prior to our pandemic, no healthcare provider, politician, or journalist had even mentioned the possibility of something like long COVID. I thought I'd beaten that really bad flu. Unfortunately, I didn't recover. Or, well, perhaps it's more accurate to say that while my body fought off the typical acute system- symptoms of COVID, I never returned to full health. In fact, I developed an entirely new set of issues that hadn't been mentioned in the list of acute COVID symptoms— Extreme fatigue, an inability to regulate my body temperature, brain fog that caused me to forget simple words like carrot, erratic blood pressure, tachycardia, dizziness and near fainting every time I stood up, new and more severe migraines, exercise intolerance, chest tightness, agitation, nausea and vomiting, and what seemed to be severe panic attacks at all hours of the day and night. Over the course of several months, I saw my primary care physician multiple times, visited several urgent care doctors, and took a trip to the emergency room in an ambulance when I woke up one night with blood pressure so high, the internet assured me I was having a stroke. I wasn't. The physical exams didn't reveal anything out of the ordinary. The blood work and scans my doctor ordered all came back normal. Over and over, I heard the same refrain from medical professionals. It's just anxiety. The best thing you can do is get out in the sun and exercise. I found myself sinking into a terrifying depression. I was unable to get out of bed for more than an hour or two a day, and even when I was out of bed, I wasn't able to do any of my pre-COVID activities like working, exercising, socializing, or even unloading the dishwasher. Most days, I couldn't keep my head up long enough to finish a full meal. I was waking up multiple times every night drenched in sweat with adrenaline coursing through my body. It was so extreme, my legs would move, mimicking the act of running, as if away from a bear attack. I nearly passed out every time I moved from lying down to sitting or sitting to standing. My chest hurt. All the lights were too bright and I couldn't catch my breath. And yet not a single doctor in New York City seemed to believe there was anything wrong with me. My care, my primary care physician suggested it was time to see a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist agreed with all the other doctors. Everything I was feeling was all in my head. Luckily, a friend who was experiencing similar post-COVID medical issues stumbled across an online support group where thousands of other people were experiencing symptoms like ours. It was there that I first heard of dysautonomia from one of the very few doctors who was aware of what would become known as long COVID and from a support group moderator who developed dysautonomia from a viral infection years before. Allison. Within a week, I found a specialist who diagnosed me with postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, POTS, a type of dysautonomia. Learning to live with dysautonomia is about more than getting a diagnosis and finding the right combination of lifestyle and pharmacological treatments to manage it. For for most people, dysautonomia is a life-changing disorder. Once we're hit with it, it's often harder to sustain our current level of employment due to both physical and cognitive fatigue. Relationships become more complicated as we need more accommodations and are often unable to offer time or emotional support to our friends and family. Our lives become more expensive as we visit countless specialists and try so many treatments. And as these things shift, so do our identities. In addition to struggling to stand up, we also find ourselves struggling with intense grief over what we've lost and grappling with what it means to be a person living with a disability in an ableist world. The most important lessons I've learned from having long COVID are to stand up for myself when everyone from doctors to coworkers keep telling me not to, to keep trying new treatments until I find out what works for me, and to not be afraid to lean on the advice of those who've been doing this work long before COVID ever existed. As you continue your journey with long COVID, you will discover what your most important lessons are too. That was beautiful, Heather. Thank you so much. Um, and that was that's one of the chapters that I read and actually learned quite a bit about myself reading, um, despite thinking that I already knew it all. So um, highly recommend folks check that out. Um, Heather, I'm going to remove the spotlight. And <laughs> there's there's a lot going on at once. Um, and next up, we have uh, the amazing Pato Ebert, uh, who is an artist, 
teacher and organizer. He is a COVID long hauler who tested positive in March 2020. He serves as chair of the Department of Art and Public Policy at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, and his lingering exhibition about long hauling debuted at Pitzer College in 2022. Um, I have his wonderful uh, show booklet here. Um, just to give you a little idea of the beautiful work that he has done. Um, and Pato will be reading uh, from his chapter called COVID Can't Be Out Outpaced, Learning Pacing and Radical Rest. Uh, Pato, turning it over to you. Well, you have to multitask me because I want to start by singing your praises and giving thanks for your vision and your diligence and your care that made this book possible and this evening possible. It's just such a gift to be part of this community and this moment in our shared history. So kudos to you for bringing us together. Um, I have to say to everyone, a week ago, I tested and learned that somehow I've been reinfected. And ever since I started long hauling in the spring of 2020, one of my symptoms is that I constantly mix up words. So <laughs> last week when I went to order my medicine, to help with the new infection, it came out Pax Livid instead of Pax Lovid. <laughs> and I howl with laughter every time I tell this story. And somehow it just helps me to counterbalance all my pseudobulba tears that um, are always happening and it helps me keep going, which is what we do together. Um, my chapter is about pacing, which is, of course, this vital practice that is chronically ill people. We pace ourselves so that we're active when we're able and we rest when we're tired. We plan extra rest ahead of and after strenuous activities and rest and pacing are something that I've done a lot over this last week in quarantine. Um, of course, it's the ME-CFS community that shared their hard-earned wisdom with us, especially ME Action's campaign to tell people living with long COVID to stop, rest, pace. So I'll start by reading um, from a section called Two Ambulance Town, Animo. I feel like a sick person, one of my students says to me during office hours. You are, I say simply, directly, lovingly, with encouragement and solidarity. We are. From our very first advisement session last September, we've talked together about being long haulers. It's the new year and we're still talking about silence and isolation, not wanting to worry or burden loved ones. The impossibility and harm of trying to carry it alone. The power of sharing. This student city of 56,000 people in the global south only has two ambulances. So when their lungs started shutting down and they called for emergency transport to the hospital, it took three hours for the ambulance to arrive at their home. I thought I was going to die, they say matter-of-factly, but in a near whisper. I still haven't told my family. This is why, part of why I write publicly about my messy process with COVID. This is why I started sharing via social media the day after I tested positive and why I haven't ceased, why the collection you're holding and in which we are meeting matters. Individually, we must always stop and take our breaks, but collectively, we cannot ever stop organizing spaces and paces of care with and for one another. Each of us individually lives in unique and ever-evolving circumstances, and we should always have the right to our respective privacy, process, and dignity. But we should never feel like we have to live in isolation to sustain these. And this next section is called Ay Tiempo. Back in the city, I spend some time with a former student, now friend. They have an exciting new job that last week had them running an art fair in LA. They invite me to come visit the Hollywood Hotel where the fair is staged. We haven't seen each other since before the pandemic. I notice a new tattoo on their wrist. It looks like handwriting, but I can't quite tell. It's dark where we're sitting poolside and my middle-aged eyes aren't so great. My compa tells me a story about visiting the studio of the legendary Mexican photographer Manuel Alvarez Bravo and seeing Ay Tiempo written twice just outside of his dark room, his place of creative alchemy. Ay Tiempo, there's time. This small and beautiful script appears across their skin in Alvarez Bravo's handwriting, a delicate single line they had inked as a reminder 
for the frenetic pace of the day to day. As we tend to one another in our spaces of mutual aid, recalibration and care, what might we dream together? What must we make time for? What might appear here in time? Thank you. Thank you so much, Pato. Um, I am gonna go ahead and uh, introduce uh, Rachel Robles and uh, add her to the spotlight now. Um, and let me just, uh, Rachel, it is so great to have you here with us. Um, Rachel wrote our chapter on accessing a diagnosis. She is a long COVID patient advocate based in Brooklyn, New York. After becoming ill in March 2020, she joined Body Politic and the Patient Led Research Collaborative, where she helps disseminate information from leading researchers to patients. Rachel is currently a senior data strategist and holds a bachelor's degree in operations research engineering from Cornell University. Rachel, I will turn it over to you. And I will hope to get this, this working in, in a moment. Sorry, everyone. Thanks, V. Um, and no worries, we understand how complex the Zoom world can be. Um, okay. So in March, 2020, with the pandemic unfolding around me, I scoured the internet for any information on how to recover from a COVID-19 infection. After about two months, I decided to search for specialists with expertise in infectious diseases in a stark contrast to the validation I'd gotten from the urgent care telehealth providers who initially diagnosed me with COVID-19. I received diagnosis after diagnosis of anxiety from these specialists because I didn't have a positive diagnostic test. Desperate and defeated with few options for my recovery, I grew weary. It was then that I read about a patient-led support group for COVID-19 patients in the New York Times. In the group, patients described having to fend for themselves because they too weren't able to receive a positive test. My experience had not been an outlier, but rather a long-standing tradition of medical providers ignoring post-viral illnesses. To add on to that, standard blood tests and imaging are often not granular enough to detect abnormalities like the ones experts believe exist in long COVID patients, pathogens hiding in tissues and microvascular damage to name a few. And without a curious physician, the investigation stops there. Patients are told everything's normal and given medications to suppress their symptoms. Through this online community of patients though, I became empowered to be my own advocate. At their recommendation, I sought out any provider who both believed me and was curious to learn more. I researched post-viral conditions such as ME-CFS and dysautonomia and found providers who were literate in those conditions. As I connected with more providers and further pursued some form of recovery, I had to make some difficult choices. While medications that help suppress symptoms can be important for reducing pain and allowing patients to function, these fixes sometimes come with side effects that often don't address a symptom's underlying cause. I decided early on that I wanted, only wanted medication if it was treating a possible cause, a condition upstream that had a hand in causing the cascading effect of long COVID. I went to many doctor's appointments, often leaving with prescriptions for medications treating nausea and eczema, but no closer to answers. Despite the heartache and trauma associated with telling an illness origin story over and over again, only to be dismissed, I continued on my journey for better medical attention. While standard blood work was consistently coming up clean, test results from my infectious disease specialist, who also has an expertise in MECFS, showed a drastically different picture. My immune function had been compromised by my COVID-19 infection, showing low humoral response, heightened T cell response, and low-grade systemic inflammation. COVID-19 had reactivated other viruses in my body, which were previously kept in check by my immune system, and this was thought to be driving some of my long COVID symptoms. I considered the diagnoses of these viruses to be a possible root cause and began an antiviral treatment to target the infections. Within a few days, I noticed that my ribs were no longer, no longer felt confined. For the first time in nine months, I was able to take a full, deep breath. With the help of my COVID literate doctors, many of whom see the value in systemic approaches, I've been able to diagnose some of the damage done by the virus, co-infections that have weakened my body, and an immune system that was put into overdrive. 
Like many post-viral patients, I'm still trekking on the path to full recovery, taking many different avenues in the hopes of someday finding an express lane to full health. In the meantime, I found relief by continuing my search for the root causes of my illness while simultaneously working on building my health from the ground up. I've seen an increasing number of medical practitioners who believe in treating the whole body, not just the parts, which has propelled me forward in my journey. With this framework, I've pursued providers and clinical trials, participating in long COVID-related research to understand more about my illness and gaining access to testing that exposes what my body needs on a cellular level. Even though my self-advocacy was and remains soaked in blood, sweat, and tears, every thoughtful diagnosis I've received since becoming ill with COVID-19 has helped ease the pain of my suffering. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, Rachel's chapter was co-written by uh, with Donna Kim Murphy and David Petrino, um, who are both healthcare providers. Um, it is a really meaty chapter with a lot of logistical advice, so I highly recommend checking it out if accessing a diagnosis is what you are looking for right now. Uh, um, I'm going to turn it over now to Padma Priya. Um, who is uh, here from India. Um, and it is quite early in the morning, I believe, for you. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, Padma Priya is the co-founder and editor-in-chief at Suno India, an award-winning podcast platform. As an independent journalist, she has also written for leading media houses in India. She's also worked as an advocacy and communication specialist for the Nobel Peace Prize winning organization, Doctors Without Borders. She has hosted multiple podcasts on underreported stories, such as Dear Pari on Adoption, the Suno India Show on Current Affairs, and a podcast on women empowerment, to name a few. Um, Padma will be reading an excerpt of her chapter uh, entitled The Search for Community, Finding Peer-to-Peer -peer, uh, Support. And I will turn it over to you, Padma Priya. Thank you so much, Fiona, for making this happen, uh, from the book to this event, everything. And also for helping me write this chapter because it was really difficult for me to leave, relive through whatever um, some of the trauma that I went through. Uh, but I think once I started writing, it was pretty therapeutic for me to do this. So yeah, thank you once again for this opportunity. Um, and yeah, it is early, but it's fine. I mean, it's good to get up early sometimes. So. After I was discharged from the hospital, I was grateful for my life. But in many ways, I felt I was back at square one. The both symptoms continued, as did every other long-term symptom I'd experienced, and I had developed new issues from the second infection. On top of my physical symptoms, I was emotionally devastated after having watched so many people die around me in the ICU. It had been exactly one year since my initial infection, but it felt a little progress had been made. It was all too much for me. There was one thing that was different about my second infection though. There was a community waiting for me. A month before I got sick the second time, I wrote another Twitter thread about my journey of trying to find a diagnosis and the trauma of, denied, of being denied care by multiple doctors. I described my symptoms in detail and before I knew it, I was receiving messages from people across the country asking me for advice. While Western countries like the United States and the UK seem to have made progress with regards to long COVID awareness and research, there was little to, research, little to no research or conversations about the disease in India. It felt like we were operating in an information vacuum. Patients invariably seemed to know more than doctors and were being forced to advocate for themselves. In many cases, patients were still being dismissed as people with anxiety. After nearly a year seeking medical care and finding most of my answers in support groups, I wasn't entirely surprised. The support groups I had been frequenting were crucial to my mental and physical health, but they were based in the UK, the US, and other countries where long COVID was better recognized. I saw a clear need for community within my own country, which was still in the midst of a deadly wave and had its own waves of long COVID. So I decided to create my own group. A few weeks after I was discharged, I started the India COVID survival groups on Telegram, now also on Twitter as at Long COVID India. And within days, over 200 people had joined. At the time of this writing, our group has nearly 500 members, a small number considering India's population. 
but we are a vibrant community nonetheless. Every day we talk about the latest developments in the long COVID world. Some days we struggle to cope. But when someone expresses their struggle, we all band together and remind them that they're not alone. We share names and often use dark humor to cope with the debilitating chronic illnesses many of us are dealing with and the emotions our experiences bring up. We also offer one another logistical support and advice, helping prepare one another for doctor visits and collectively arming ourselves with information on how to self-advocate in medical settings. I started this group because I realized that the medical establishment, media, and other powerful stakeholders weren't going to solve this problem for us. If doctors were dismissing one of us, that was one too many. Being part of other support groups had helped me immensely in advocating for myself. And I realized how vital peer-to-peer -peer support was. I knew Indian patients needed these resources too. Earlier in my career, I spent years as an advocacy manager for Doctors Without Borders. This experience taught me that patients often had to advocate for themselves. And, a patient, and as a patient, I knew how difficult this could be, especially in a country as vast as mine or one with competing political interests. Even patient advocates in more developed nations are facing the same questions. How do you raise awareness about long COVID in a country where the government's main focus is individual responsibility rather than mitigating infection? How do you raise awareness in a country where policymakers are forcing a choice between the economy and the public health? Patient advocacy has always driven change in public health. And I'm not surprised at all that patient support groups and people living in co with COVID are at the forefront of finding answers about long COVID. In a global health crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic, we need contributions from a vast range of experts. But most importantly, we need patients' voices. This small community of long haulers I have built, and I'm a member of, is following the science more closely than most of the doctors in my country. Many of us have turned this quest for understanding our bodies into a part-time job. In our desire for answers, we have daily conversations about one another's doctor's visits and results and hold one another up when we sense one of us is about to fall. We share research papers, articles, podcasts, and YouTube videos. Many of us have given interviews to national and international media to create awareness about long COVID in India. We, dump, we debunk misinformation when we see it and are always on the lookout for like-minded doctors to join our group. Today, this group includes some healthcare providers and researchers who patiently answer our queries about the human body and the immune system and advise us on what to do. To me, these health workers are the medical ambassadors, best and medical establishments, best ambassadors. They have been instrumental in helping traumatized patients regain trust in healthcare providers. Our group also continues to reach out to medical establishment at large, urging providers to shed the denialism about long COVID. Some of us have even part, offered to participate in scientific research and are now in the process of starting our own patient-led research survey inspired by the work other support groups have done. As exhausting as all this sounds, it is important for us long haulers to come together in some form, whether on Facebook, Slack, WhatsApp, other social media, or even in person with members of our local community and keep speaking up. I'm in touch with long haulers from other parts of South Asia and the struggle is real, is real, as the research has yet to penetrate our countries. Only patients and peer support groups are driving forward this crucial conversation on long COVID and related chronic illnesses. We demand our governments to do more policy-wise and that they allocate funding for research in the post-viral illnesses, not just for us, but for everyone in South Asia who has battled the post-viral illness. Talking about long COVID consistently and continuously not only helps break down the stigmas, but also informs others who may be in need of care or answers. All around the world, patients are gathering, writing, and advocating. Our metaphorical voices reverberate against one another and grow stronger. Together, we are speaking long COVID support into existence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Padma Priya. And um, if anyone here is connected with long haulers in South Asia. Padma Priya's support group is doing a lot of amazing work. Um, maybe you can put the, the info on it in the, in the chat in case some um, folks would like to join. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's lovely to see you. 
Um, I am now going to uh, introduce uh, Terry Wilder, who uh, is, I'm going to be co-reading her chapter with her. I, I did not uh, write the chapter with her. I will tonight be playing the part of Yohaira M. Um, but I'll, I'll first just quickly introduce Terry. Uh, Terry is a social worker, an activist focused on disability justice for people living with HIV, long COVID, and myalgic encephalomyelitis, ME. She was diagnosed with ME in March 2016. Since her diagnosis, she has worked with elected officials, public health departments, healthcare providers, and activists across the globe. She is the co-leader of ME Action in New York. Um, and Terry's chapter is entitled, Am I Making Any Sense? And it is about, quote unquote, brain fog or cognitive dysfunction. Um, Terry, do you want to kick us off? Sure. So first of all, I want to thank my co-author, Yohai, uh, for working with me on this. Um, and I also am wearing my ACT UP t-shirt tonight to recognize um, that LGBT and HIV active activists raised me and inform the activism that I do um, for disability justice. Um, and thank you, Fiona, for having me tonight. I appreciate it. Um, the chapter that we wrote is not really written. Um, it's a recording of a conversation we had to accommodate uh, my cognitive dysfunction. Um, so that is why it's in the form of two people talking. So I'll begin here. I was diagnosed with myalgic encephalomyelitis in 2016, but I should tell you about when it really came to my attention. I started my PhD program in 2005, and I was supposed to be done by 2015. Around 2014, I remember thinking, something's not shooting right with my brain. I'm not tracking conversations. I would be in the middle of a conversation, and I couldn't remember what we were talking about, or I couldn't retrieve a word that I knew was on the tip of my tongue. I couldn't work on my dissertation because things wouldn't go from my brain to my fingertips on my laptop. I thought, I'm in my late 40s. I'm getting closer to 50. Maybe this is what happens. You tried to normalize it. I totally tried to normalize it and justify it. I wondered, am I becoming dumber? But I'm not a stupid person. I've always been successful in school and work. What is happening? Is my brain melting? It wasn't until I got diagnosed with MECFS in March of 2016 that it all made sense. Cognitive dysfunction is a key symptom for my diagnosis in many of the clinical criteria for myalgic encephalomyelitis. Once I read the Institute of Medicine's 2015 diagnostic criteria for MECFS, I started looking things up and connecting with other people within me and hearing their stories. This was common. That's when I really realized. Tell me more about the brain fog symptoms. You talked about the thoughts in your head not getting translated to your fingertips while working on the dissertation. What else was a part of the brain fog? Word retrieval was an issue. I often couldn't find the words I wanted to say, sometimes in the middle of a conversation. It was harder for me to write sentences, like putting the words in order or making the paragraphs flow for the, for the main point. I also worked for a very large HIV website, and I used to write news articles for them. I approached the editor, whom I've had a very long, good relationship with, and I told him I couldn't write articles anymore. But I asked him if there was something that we could figure out, because I get so much fulfillment out of this work. We ended up reaching an agreement where I could do recorded interviews with people about HIV related topics and we would transcribe and edit them. That allowed me to still make a contribution, still make some money. Sometimes I didn't understand what people were saying to me. I couldn't receive the message that they were conveying in a sentence. I would say, I'm sorry, what are you trying to say? What does that mean? I was also having memory issues. I would watch a movie and then a few weeks later, I would watch it again. And I wouldn't realize that I'd already seen it until later. The cognitive issues that have just kind of been all over the place for me 
but I will say that they are at their worst when I'm in a crash. My guess would be that that's pretty common for people who have cognitive dysfunction, that it's worse when they're in a crash or in the middle of post-exertion malaise. Did you have people in your personal life who were really important to you in helping you manage the cognitive symptoms specifically? Yeah, the one memory that I have that really resonated with me about this is a really good friend. I was talking to my friend Olivia on the phone and all of a sudden, I couldn't remember what we were talking about. I just literally stopped talking and I started to tear up saying, I cannot remember what we're talking about. I don't know what word I'm trying to find in my brain. She was so supportive and kind and said, it's okay, take your time. We can change the subject and we can talk about something else. She reminded me of what we were talking about. I just remember her kindness and her love and her patience. She didn't make me feel embarrassed or feel any discomfort. I think this is probably one of the most lovely memories I have of anybody in my life. And it really meant a lot. I've never forgotten that she did that. We all need more people like that in our lives. Everybody needs an Olivia in their life. Thank you so much, Terry. And I don't know, I, I assume you did not see because you were reading, but we have folks sharing their experiences of brain fog in the chat connecting with what you're describing and connecting with one another. And if you are someone attending this, this event who has not experienced this symptom, I would encourage you not only to read the rest of Terry and Yochai's chapter, but to check out the beautiful comments that are coming in in the chat. Thank you, Thank you. so much, Terry. Thank you. We are now going to uh, move to the chapter on financial uh, and employment issues, which is called With Disability Come Rights. And we're going to start um, with an excerpt. This chapter was co-written by three people. It describes the financial situation that these three people have dealt with due to chronic illness. And then it also goes in very in depth on a number of ways, uh, kind of avenues you can take to attempt to support yourself financially. Um, so we're gonna start actually with a recorded uh, video from Leticia uh, Suarez, who I'm going to read her bio now. Leticia Suarez, is a biologist, scientist, and educator. She has earned a master's in ecology and a PhD in biology. She was a postdoctoral scholar when she became disabled by COVID while living in Ontario, Canada. Currently, she lives on the land of the Patacho indigenous people in the state of Bahia in Northeast Brazil. So Leticia recorded this video for us uh, from Brazil. And I know she, I, she may still be here as well uh, as an attendee, but it's quite late there. So I'm going to now share my screen. Um, can everyone see the video? Hopefully there's, some, okay, great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and play this video. And then after this, we're gonna hear from Alison Sobrana who was one of Leticia's co-authors. So stay tuned for Other than our immigrant status, our financial lives were similar to other millennials with all generational wealth. We lived paycheck to paycheck, agonized over which bills to prioritize, and struggled to build savings. Despite our circumstances, for a long time, I deeply regretted having chosen to risk COVID exposure over financial loss. Thinking about it leaves a bitter taste in my mouth, the taste of injustice. Today, I accept that we were given no other option. But I will never forget the unjust choice we are forced to make between our basic income and our health. It's moral and economically unsustainable for individuals and for communities. Testing was very limited and we were only able to test because Israel was an essential worker. To our surprise, we tested negative. But despite my negative test result, I went on to develop myriad multi-system symptoms that fluctuated in nature, number, severity, and duration, leaving me confused and isolated. I was having a different experience from what the world was telling me COVID-19 looked like. Not having a confirmatory test result was held against us by healthcare providers, employers, and insurance providers 
who saw it as the ultimate evidence to deny what our bodies were experiencing and invalidate our concerns. The stress and mental exertion of advocating for ourselves to medical providers triggered episodes of PEM with symptom relapses that left me bed bound for weeks at a time. I frequently realized that seeking a diagnosis under these circumstances was often too costly for my health and that the process required pacing and planning on my part to avoid worsening my overall health and well-being. It took us 14 months to get a long COVID diagnosis in our medical records. We were able to get that to be diagnosed because I connected with another patient on Instagram who recommended a doctor in our area who was knowledgeable about long COVID. Find out how other long haulers in, our, in your area are faring and who they're seeing. While policy, research, and clinical practice catches up, your community is your best and most compassionate resource. As we searched for answers, it very quickly became clear to us that the current systems ostracize workers seeking help and overwhelmingly benefit the employer, while rejecting evidence-based reasoning that both testing and tracing are intrinsically imperfect. After talking to others in our patient support group, we came to the realization that reapplying for workers' compensation was not worth the costs given the current policies in place. If you find yourself in a similar situation, know that it's not a failure to stop pursuing avenues of support that have failed you. As I rely on resilience and constantly try to rebuild and adapt to life with long COVID, I grapple with much rage. This anger comes from knowing that my family isn't alone in this experience. Many people are financially struggling while chronically ill because they were forced to work for income during a pandemic, with all systems in place to allow for rest and safety. Most of us who don't have a proof of a positive test are unable to access care and social support due to willful ignorance and denial regarding what COVID-19 and its aftermath can look like. Instead, we rely on the work and expertise of disability activists and chronically ill people to show us the way and give us the support that social systems should be providing. Thank you so much, Leticia. And we had a comment in the chat about how important it is to understand that it's you're not a failure if you stop pursuing avenues. And I want to note that a lot of the advice in this book comes with that caveat. Um, and, and on that note, um, I'm now going to turn it over to um, Allison, who is one of the co-authors of this chapter. Allison is a disability activist based in Fort Collins, Colorado living with complex chronic illness caused by a viral infection in 2014. She's passionate about helping chronically ill people navigate disability rights, medical care, and benefits as a former care coordinator for Colorado's Medicaid program. Allison is actively involved with direct peer support and policy advocacy as a board member of Body Politic. Allison, turn it over to you. Thank you. In 2014, I got a virus and I never recovered. Now I live with MECFS. In May 2020, I got involved with long COVID advocacy to help long haulers navigate similar challenges. The first piece of advice I give to people with long COVID is this, you have a disability now. There are disability rights and benefits that exist to help protect you at your job and provide you with benefits if you can't work and there's a large community of disabled people here to help you navigate them. These resources are not perfect by any means, and a community of advocates works every day to improve them. But the sooner you understand this, the easier it will be to support your body and its new needs as you learn to live with long COVID. 
I didn't know I was disabled until several years into my illness. I had false perceptions of what disability looked like due to stereotypes. I didn't understand that a dynamic fluctuating health condition could and often does fit the definition of disability. So even though I was aware that disability rights and benefits existed, I didn't understand that I could benefit from them. I went through years of pushing and crashing while job hopping in a desperate attempt to find employment that would work for an unpredictable fluctuating chronic illness without requesting accommodations. These efforts were not successful and led to worse health outcomes for me. So here I am telling you what I wish someone had told me. One, draw on disabled community tips to survive financially. One of the best examples I know of this is the How to Get on WordPress blog, a website created to help people with chronic illness self-advocate for government assistance, disability benefits, and more. Two, educate yourself about disability benefits. If you're denied disability benefits or workers' compensation, it is not your fault, nor is it a reflection of how disabled or sick you are. Look for a lawyer who specifically works on the benefit type you are navigating. Three, ask for accommodations at work. Long COVID can be considered a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. The Job Accommodations Network at askjan.org is a great resource to learn more about the accommodations process and your rights under the ADA. Four, apply for government assistance. Government assistance programs can help reduce expenses, which is important when disability, disability benefits do not cover all of your expenses. Talk to your Centers for Independent Living or ask your primary care provider to refer you to a social worker or case manager to help you apply. If you would benefit from help with daily tasks like showering safely, getting dressed, including compression stockings for those of us with POTS, medication management, meal preparation, even if a family member is currently providing this kind of help, I encourage you to reach out to your local Aging and Disability Resource Center. Five, health insurance and medical bills. Find a local expert by going to localhealth.healthcare.gov to find a professional health coverage guide or enrollment assistant near you and make an appointment. Hospitals also often have charity care or financial assistance programs you might qualify for, so please ask about that before you pay a hospital bill. Last but not least, six, utilize local help through your Centers for Independent Living. Centers for Independent Living are community-based nonprofits run by people with disabilities to help people with disabilities. They can help you by connecting you with tools, resources, and support to make your new normal living with long COVID a little bit easier. It can be difficult to adjust to a new normal with long COVID, especially when financial worries and benefits denials can be daily stressors. But there is a community of disabled and chronically ill folks who have been down this difficult path before you, and there are ways to ease your burden. When you're living with an illness that is poorly understood with minimal options for treatment, that added ease can really make a difference. It sure has for me. Thank you so much, Allison. And this is a perfect example of the, the more logistically focused advice that you'll find in this book. And I see Shamir saying in the chat that many of us didn't even know SSDI was possible until we started talking to Allison Body Politic. It's true. Allison has been an amazing resource in a lot of support groups. And so we're hopeful that putting her wisdom into this book will take a little bit of that burden of labor off of Allison and allow this advice to reach so many more people. So thank you so much, Allison. We're so grateful uh, to you. Um, I'm now going to introduce our final speaker of the night, um, uh, Morgan Stevens. Uh, I will introduce her. Morgan Stevens is a freelance journalist and production assistant with CNN. Her writing and reporting has appeared in CNN Opinion, CNN Politics, HuffPost, and the Washington Post. She's writing a book on long COVID in which she will detail her experience and report on how the US addresses the public health crisis. And Morgan is reading an excerpt from her chapter entitled, Down in the Well, We Will Mourn and Sing, Surviving Mental Illness. Um, I think this is gonna be a really powerful note to end on. Um, Morgan, I am uh, very honored to turn it over to you to close out the uh, reading portion of this event. Thank you so much. and. 
you know, full disclosure, I am in a crash right now. So bear with me. I feel like I can be frank with you guys. So I wouldn't miss this for the world. And um, here we go. One of the unfortunate truths about our illness is that we can't exactly return to our old, vibrant and healthy lives in a slot snap. But I, if I look back to where I was then and where I am now, the healing has been substantial. I got there with tiny steps, steps that to a non-chronically ill person might be seen as ordinary, yet I and those around me knew they were monumental achievements. It started with baths. Sometimes I'd end up taking two or three baths in a row because they helped pass the time and brought momentary relief from the physical pain, despair, and restlessness. In an occupational therapy session focused on self-care and pacing, I joked about my inclination to take more than one bath a day. In her professional expertise and wisdom, my therapist said, you're healing. If you wanna take two baths, take two baths. If you feel like you need permission, just think of me saying, it's okay. So if you too want to take two baths, here is your permission. If you want to listen to the same comforting song on repeat, drive around your town aimlessly, do nothing at all, binge watch trash TV, or stare at the smoke from incense wafting through your space in silence, that's okay. I've learned to be less critical of myself and to honor what brings me moments of joy, no matter how small or quote unquote weird I thought they were before. As we heal, if that's all we have to get us through, then that's all we have. As time passes, these moments of joy are no longer as fleeting. This doesn't minimize the debilitation our illness inflicts on our life. Even with these hard truths, there is solace. You have a community that will mourn with you. I decided early on to measure my progress not in days, weeks, or even months, but in three-month timelines. On good days, you'll laugh about silly things with friends, maybe even new friends who share your illness experience. You might even develop a dark sense of humor like I did finding amusement in the absurdity of how seriously I used to take my five and 10 year goals, how rigid my plan for my life was and how I was convinced that I needed to sit, take very specific steps to succeed. I know that's not true now. Illness has taught me that. Know that you're not alone. I offer you community and permission to be sad devastated, confused, or angry, like really fucking angry some days. We can strike a balance, surrender, and be active in our quest for healing. When I talk about healing, I mean finding peace, fulfillment, and a semblance of normalcy in life outside of crisis mode. This looks different for each long hauler. I've come to terms with the fact that I'm a passenger, in my illness and in my life. This act of surrender in pre-COVID times would have left me feeling helpless. Now it's incredibly freeing. I have my toolbox to keep me above water. Don't minimize these tools, lean into them. The last thing I'll leave you with is that you might think in this silence, this lack of acknowledgement from public health officials that the world is moving on. You might grieve and rage at the nature of your illness and its cruel invisibility. You might despair that you've been forgotten. At times, these fears drag me back into that dark well. But as much as you might feel stuck there, remember that wells are also a source of supply of nourishment and resource. You haven't been forgotten, not by me, and not by the millions of other people like you. Together, our brittle, broken voices are getting louder, and in unison, they'll sing out. We'll get the help we so desperately need 
and deserve. <clears throat> and when it gets dark, as it sometimes does, you might return to the essentials of what makes life worth living. Tonight, I'll put on my headphones and listen to Jeff Buckley and Elizabeth Frazier sing all flowers in time, then towards the sun. His hopeful falsetto sink into my bones and carry me toward tomorrow. <laughs> 